Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. We had planned to invite Burlington Council member Joe McGee back onto our show as we got closer to town meeting day so we could highlight Joe's re-election campaign. And then Joe did the unexpected. He announced that he's not seeking re-election. So we've invited him to come back on sooner versus later so we can talk about his tenure on the Burlington City Council, what he sees as being the challenges going forward, and what went into that decision not to seek re-election because he said it wasn't an easy decision to make. So Joe, welcome back and thank you for spending this time with us. Keith, thank you so much for having me. And I, you know, part of me is sad that I'm not here talking about my re-election campaign. Um, I've enjoyed my time on the city council, uh, most of my time on the city council. So. <laughs> okay. I, uh, uh, I'm proud of the, a lot of the work that I've been able to do. And there are a lot of things that I feel like I'm leaving unfinished. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, uh, I had to ask myself the question if, this is really where my energy is is best is put to best use and where I can make the most difference. Um, and so, you know, I'm uh, I'm a renter in uh, Burlington's Old North End. Uh, I represent downtown and part of the Old North End. Um, the district has changed uh, with our redistricting efforts uh, over the last year, so that new ward will go into effect on town meeting day. And it's a ward that looks a lot different than the one that I first got elected to represent in 2021. Um, and so that, that was a consideration for me as well. You know, a lot of the um, long-term connections that I made with constituents in that first campaign uh, now are in ward two. Um, and so that um, uh, it, it's the ward that, uh, Ward three is currently a much harder ward to campaign in. And while uh, I think I'd be up for that challenge, uh, it's definitely hard to uh, start in your scratch on a campaign like that. Um, so I was going to say, so let's piece out some of the things that you've already touched on, because some of them are the issues that I really have an interest in hearing. As part of your announcement, you had made the comment about the affordability or the inaffordability of the rent where you live. Is that, are the rents higher in that area in Burlington or is it just Burlington in general has such incredibly high rents that is prohibitive for people to live there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Burlington is struggling like a lot of communities with uh, not just housing affordability, but availability. So there are plenty of folks who are looking for housing that just simply can't find like they have they have the money to afford housing. They just can't find a place to live. Um, and so that is a challenge for me. You know, the apartment I have now is I'm, I'm comfortable in it. You know, I, I can afford it, um, you know, but if that were to change. Uh, I don't know that I would be able to find another place within the boundaries of the ward to be able to continue to represent it. Um, and I think, you know, the the entire state is struggling with a, a housing stock that is uh, unable to meet the needs of uh, people who live here. Um, and we're, we're seeing that uh, in the number of unsheltered folks who are... Um, on the streets of Burlington right now. Uh, and it's, it's a statewide issue. So um, that is certainly an area where I feel like we could be doing more work. 
I mean, I absolutely agree. Just looking at central Vermont and particularly the impact that the flood had had on housing availability and the increase you know, in our homeless population. So looking at the time that you have been on the Burlington Council, what are the th those things that you're really proud that you were able to help the city of Burlington to achieve? Well, it's uh, it's hard because you know you get elected and you make uh, sometimes make promises and then you get in there and find out that you don't actually have as much power as uh, you thought to make any change on any number of issues. Um, and so, you know, I think many of the things that I'm most proud of really uh, come from a place of the council using our voice to um, advocate for uh, changes that need to happen at the state level um, and just changes in the way of thinking uh, in terms of, you know, uh, advocating for harm reduction uh, and overdose prevention centers, uh, different ways of looking at some of the uh, very real crises that we're facing um, in Burlington, uh, having the council uh, unanimously say that we don't endorse the war on drugs and we're working to uh, prioritize health approaches to substance use disorder and the opioid crisis. Um, and uh, also last March, uh, passing a resolution condemning transphobia in Burlington, as we've seen uh, a, a committed group of transphobic individuals stickering around uh, the downtown and the New North End. Um, and the council passed that resu resolution unanimously. Um, I think that was an important step for us to take. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the actions that were behind that resolution did not come to fruition in the way that they should have. And so um, uh, I think we'll talk more about uh, things that I feel are left un undone. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to expand on that. I was going to say exactly where I was looking at going after making a comment of, what you seem to be saying was the council acted in a socially responsible as well as an oversight of infrastructure and the sort of mechanisms of government. And as a former select board member in a small community in Vermont, I, I appreciate the challenges that you were facing. So I also know that you spent a great time working on issues of police reform. Yeah. And and I know that some of that project is still under development. So what are those issues that you wish that you had had time to complete and that you see as being priorities for the, the Burlington City Council going forward? Yeah, I think um, police oversight is probably the, the biggest question that uh, we still have yet to answer. And um, there's a joint committee right now in the council working on a charter change, a different charter change to put on the ballot in March uh, that will hopefully give the police commission more power uh, to be a more effective oversight body for the police department. Um, I am hopeful that that will yield something that is stronger than what we currently have. Um, in that it's something that voters will approve in March. Um, another area I think is, uh, really around training and that, that question can't be answered by Burlington alone. Uh, and the Vermont has a single police academy, uh, where officers go to get training. And, uh, I think there are many unanswered questions and, uh, really what, does a 21st century police force look like? What are the skills and the tools that we want to lead with when we're training next generations of law enforcement? And um, what do we, in addition to that, what are the different uh, response models that we need? Because uh, we know that police cannot respond to every crisis that we face uh, from a health or safety 
perspective. Um, and to that end, the Burlington Fire Department recently started a community response team, which is uh, a bit more informal. Uh, they're mostly on the ground in the downtown, um, responding to uh, calls where someone's unresponsive and might be suspected of having experienced an overdose. Um, and so, you know, we're in a time uh, with regard to public safety and public health where uh, we need innovative solutions to come forward. Uh, it's clear how we've been doing things is not working. It has not worked. Um, and I think, you know, we're on the cusp of making some really uh, important changes that uh, I'm hopeful I will see before my time on the council is over. Now, as part of the press conference where you announced that you would not be, or the, the statement that was released when you announced you would not be seeking re-election, there was a comment about divisiveness on the council and also moving aside so that trust could be rebuilt between the council and the citizens of Burlington. Could you share a little more with us about what you see as being how how severe is this problem, and yeah. what is it what is it really going to take for some healing to happen? Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of what I've seen. Speaking specifically about serving on the council and being in that space, um, there is a bitter partisanship that um, often gets in the way of us finding collaborative solutions to some of the issues that we face. Um, uh, you know, I don't know that anybody would say it publicly, but that I will say it. There's definitely uh, moments where there's concern about who's going to get credit for any particular thing. Um, you know, we have local elections every year in Burlington, whether it's for uh, mayor every three years or uh, rotating city council elections every other year. Um, it, it's hard because, you know, it's a, we live in a small town. We like to think we're a big city, but we are, we're not very big. 42,000 people is not, uh, not a big city. And so when some of the, um, some of the antics of big city political machines find their way into our, uh, local government in Burlington, it's, uh, it's a struggle. Because, you know, we're practically volunteers. We get $5,000 a year to do that job. And um, everyone's working full time on top of that. And so um, I think there's a real opportunity to have uh, to be a little bit more um, forgiving and forgive each other our humanity and uh, show some grace um, in, in those more heated political fights. Um, and, you know, at the same time, I think there's a divisiveness in our dialogue as a society right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of pain, uh, at many, at many different levels, there's different layers to it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I've just noticed that particularly for me over the last few months, uh, the backlash that I'm receiving on social media um, for advocating for some of the things that I advocate for. Uh, I think on some level, there's a lack of understanding about what the city council does and does not have power to do. And um, uh, just a real frustration, you know, it, it is frustrating. It is uncomfortable. It is disconcerting to, uh, see the way society is failing so many people uh, in uh, how many unsheltered folks there are on our streets, how many folks are uh, using in public because they have no private safe place to use. And um, uh, just our systems of care and support are stretched to the absolute maximum and uh, clearly do not have the resources to be able to provide um what what people need right now and uh it is 
it's frustrating for me being an advocate for overdose prevention centers and harm reduction and uh, health focused approaches to substance use disorder to uh, realize that I really, at the end of the day, only have a voice on these things uh, and don't have a lot of power to wave my magic wand and uh, make it happen. Um, and so that it's, it's hard when, uh, the, the backlash comes on social media and then there's no, there's no space to have a, um, a respectful dialogue about those I, issues. I was going to ask you, you know, if you had experienced a backlash or how you were treated by social media. So thank you for addressing it. Yeah. So with our remaining time here, all of the things you say are the things that I would want to support in somebody serving in government in some capacity or advocacy in some capacity. What is it that you envision going forward? Or is this just, I need to take a rest and I will see what presents itself and then make a decision? Because, you know, I'm sure there are people who are ready to start helping your campaign. I had suggested governor, but I would accept what, whatever you think you might like to run for. Yeah, um, I appreciate that very much. I, uh, this has been a challenging, it'll be two and a half years by the time I'm done in April. Um, I haven't, I've. I don't enjoyed is not the right. <laughs> I have been humbled by this experience. <laughs> it, it, it's always a learning experience. And th there's a sense of, and it's really not something you can describe. It's like, I help to create something that's going to make our city a better place for people to live. Mm -hmm. And we used to be able to say, I can take pride in that. But that's become sort of, you know, a taboo word, but it's, yeah. I help to create something that makes this better for the people coming after me. Right. And I, you know, I, it takes a while to learn the ins and outs and how to, how and when to pull a certain lever and not to pull a certain lever uh, when it comes to governing. Uh, in negotiating on certain policies. Um, I feel like I am just now learning that uh, and I will continue to learn it. Um, and I think it's hard in the moment to really zoom out and say, all right, with this vote that I'm taking tonight, what does it look like for Burlington? Not tomorrow, but five or 10 or 15 years down the road. And making decisions that way doesn't necessarily lend itself well to re-election slogans the following year or the year after. Um, but, you know, there's a hope, uh, and I, I'm pretty confident that uh, when everything shakes out in a few years, that hopefully, I, I don't want to say that I'll be proven right, but that um, the things that I've advocated for and will continue to advocate for will ultimately lead to a a better community. Um, and I guess I am, I'm disappointed to be stepping down and not be able to see that through and um, continue to be that voice. Uh, but I think, you know, going forward, I, I'm certainly looking forward to a little bit of a break. And um, uh, I am hoping to be more of an advocate on uh, harm reduction. Uh, for overdose prevention centers and uh, be able to focus on uh, one or two issues rather than having to um, learn pretty quickly about dozens, which is the challenge of being on a municipal body, which you understand. Oh, exactly. It's I, I need to understand the social concerns at the same time that I need to understand what it takes to maintain a road. Yep. And, and they're entirely different sets of knowledge and different people that you would seek out for, for advice. So it sounds as though I might expect to be seeing you around the state house advocating for safe injection sites 
and a more comprehensive approach that Joe McGee isn't necessarily going to disappear from the landscape. That is correct. And I'm right. looking forward to some time behind the scenes. <laughs> it, well, it's more in front than what you're going to realize, but okay. So mm -hmm. thank you for spending this time with us. Thank, thank you for the work that you have done and that you try to do on the Burlington City Council. Safe journey ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thanks very much. And I'm sure I'll see you around the State House. You got <laughs> it. People who routinely watch all things LGBTQ will have hopefully remembered a reference several months ago to a new theater company, production company here in Vermont. The premise of we should get to tell our own stories and we should get to write our own stories. So for this interview, the people behind that are our guests. So please welcome Rye and Nicole. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> and, and we've been talking beforehand, so we're all pretty excited already. Yes. So, so sit back <laughs> and relax. So yes. from, from having read some of the news, the public media accounts, you have a strong connection to Vermont, a strong connection with each other. Could you talk a little bit about that? And then we'll start talking about why Between the Willows, what was the vision? Absolutely, yeah. Do, do, uh, do you wanna talk about it, Nicole? Do you want me to talk about it? Um, I can start. Sure, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I've grown up in Vermont. I was, you know, born and raised here, been here my whole life. Um, I'm currently away in Pennsylvania for college, but I'm about the age where I'm like, I want to go back. I miss it. I realize I left a good thing behind. <laughs> and me and Rye, actually, funny thing, we were in preschool together because we grew up in the same district. And Rye doesn't remember this at all. But Not it's really. <laughs> And I went to a uh, middle school at a different school, so we didn't really know each other at all in, until high school when we reconnected. Yeah, um, yeah, same, uh, similar to Nicole. I grew up in Essex. Um, I didn't move out until twenty twenty one, I believe. No, twenty twenty two, probably. <laughs> and then. Um, uh now I live in well then I lived in Winooski and now I live in Burlington so I've never left Vermont um <laughs> but uh so my our I mean the connection is strong between the two of us we have a mutual you know 40 plus years of living in Vermont um and so <laughs> uh I think you know it's palpable the love and appreciation we have for the state um so yeah we met in high school uh doing theater <laughs> that that, that was I was going to say okay. that was going to be my next sort of segue is I understand that both of you were involved in theater presentations at Essex High School. Yeah. So what was it that each of what was the roles that each of you took on in putting on a production at your high school? <sighs> Oh, so I'll go first for this one. Uh, so Allie, who was the director um, for our tenure at high school, um, actually was also my middle school director. She directed at Essex Middle School for about three years. Um, and then when I went to high school and people in my grade went into high school, she then took the job over at Essex High School. Um, so actually, I, I've worked, I worked with her for seven years continuously through high school. Uh, but I didn't start acting until freshman year. And so uh, when I got to high school, I started auditioning and I was terrible and, <laughs> and didn't know how to do any of it. And I'd never sung before. So like I spoke, sang my uh, freshman year audition for You're in Town um, and thankfully still got in the show. I don't know how, uh, but probably, you know, the assigned male at birth nature of <laughs> and the lack thereof in, in high school theater. Um, and so uh, I just got hooked and I fell in love with 
creating art and uh, I knew it was my passion. And so I just was auditioning for every show and any show I didn't get in, I would um, do tech for. And so I did all, I was on board to do all 12 shows at Essex High School, um, but the pandemic, unfortunately. But that's my long and the short of it. <laughs> I was gonna say an actor who also has experience with the tech aspect yeah. is a bit of a novelty and it's good knowledge to have. So Nicole, yes. while, yes. while Rye was auditioning and being terrible at it, uh, awful. <laughs> what? What? And, and you know, I think I came to the production of You're in Town, but we won't go there yet. You will get there. So, Nicole, what were you doing that you were doing well during the same time? <laughs> um, probably dance. I didn't catch on the theater train until junior year of high school, or technically the end of sophomore year, but I um, did some very, very bad. Uh, middle school shows that will stay buried and, <laughs> but I've been a dancer for about 15 years 16 years now and I was mostly performing with Vermont youth dancers in high school as well as Alon's Academy of Classical Ballet in both their Nutcracker and Spring Showcase so I was like really heavy into the dance side of things and around my sophomore year I did tech for Once on this Island it was the children's play for that year which Rye was in and the lead of um <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but that's kind of how I got my in and then they took me on as the dance captain for the fall production of Big Fish and from there I wasn't supposed to be in the show but they said do you want to do a solo so I kind of got like chucked into the show and then was in a couple scenes and became a part of the ensemble by accident <laughs> and <laughs> then I did my first play that I ever did was our junior year of Frankenstein um and then I that's when I got hooked that's when I said oh my god I love this I've always been a play person I then did the senior musical but it was the plays that really stuck with me that's what I love to do so before we segue into so you graduate from high school where did the idea of this production theater company come from Nicole what are you majoring in at that college in Pennsylvania uh nutrition and dietetics uh, <laughs> oh, okay not not what I was expecting but okay I oh, I if I I wish I could be a dance major but first of all this college does not have a dance major they only have a dance minor and it conflicts with the schedule but I am on the dance team I'm a lieutenant on the dance team this semester and I choreograph with them. So I'm I'm plenty busy with dance over here. <laughs> All right. So you graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. What and I take it that you stayed in touch? Yeah, absolutely. So how did the idea for Between the Willows come into being? And what were you hoping it was going to provide? that community theater was missing? Um, well, so the seeds were definitely planted while we were still in high school because Nicole and I um, and a few other uh, great friends of ours were collaborating um, to do, every year at the end of the year, um, Essex has a student-directed musical. Um, so like students get the opportunity, generally seniors, but sometimes juniors and depending on uh, who signs up. Um, but Nicole, I was going to be directing, Nicole was going to be uh, choreographing, and we had some other friends doing some of the other aspects. And so Nicole and I were sort of designing a very abstract version of Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> we, it was we, going to be so we, good. <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we were uh, really prepared to do that. Um, and we try to, we like spicing things up. And so we just try to like, basically take it and then tear it apart and then put it back together. Um, and it was going to be super weird and awesome and awful. Um, but then, uh, unfortunately, we graduated in 2020, which, of course, is, is the wonderful year of the pandemic. So that never came to fruition. Um, I I had tickets for that. Yeah, <laughs> that was us. Yeah. That was us. 
Um, and yeah, it, it, I mean, the, the, the cast was amazing and the students were wonderful. Yeah. And it was really, we had just got like maybe three rehearsals into the process because it, it, it tends to overlap with the, the one act. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to schedule because uh, we were, Nicole and I were both in the one act um, while also directing the show. So it was kind of navigating that. But it, yeah, it was a bummer. It was a really bummer. But there were bigger, far bigger problems in the world happening at that point. <laughs> okay. So what made you decide to found Between the Willows? I can do. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had um, a free period together during our senior year and we would just sit in the music hallway and talk or sleep or like play music or cry whatever the day required yeah. um, and we kind of started talking like what if we did shows after high school what if we just like I don't know did something else after this because everything was very up in the air we were both like kind of trying to go to college I, I'm gonna, I, I'm just going to step in really quickly here because with my venerable age, I can't resist it. You're our Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney with let's put on a show. Let's put on a show. <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, like Nicole was saying, we just kind of, uh, we're always like spitballing things and, and really putting things forth. And we were like, what if we did this show? And like, we made it all like weird and we gender swapped everything. And, uh, I mean, we would we would have done it for Beauty and the Beast. We were really thinking about it for Beauty and the Beast. We were like, what if we cast this person in this role? And it was super weird and funky, and it played with all these dynamics that no one ever thought of before. And we didn't do it. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a significant undertaking. Mm -hmm. yeah, did, yes. did you had uh, did did you have other people who? were willing to buy into this to be part of the process or was it essentially the two of you standing in the backyard with a sheet behind you and somebody holding a flashlight well, <laughs> <laughs> well i'd say at the start it was kind of an idea just between the two of us and we didn't really think it was gonna take off at least i didn't i don't know about you ray i but... i i had faith okay but... We for the sake of this for the narrative for the narrative <laughs> we didn't know it was going to happen. <laughs> this was also like summer 2020, so it felt like nothing yeah. was going to take off. And I feel like around the year, the school year of 2021, is when we were like, we should do something. I miss theater. I miss performing. I miss the community we had in high school. The pandemic really put a wrench in all of that for both of us. Mm -hmm. Let's do something. It was like let's put on a cabaret in your lawn like anything please anything I would so we started throwing around ideas let's do this play let's do let's I have this idea just the most random things we could think of and I said oh wait I have an idea for a show that's been sitting in the back of my mind for a year and Ryan was like why didn't you say anything earlier <laughs> and so May of 2022 is when we decided to put on our first production which was entitled The Four Seasons and it was a 30 minute dance show all based off of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And that is when we got more people involved. So that was kind of the kicker. And it was like, we need help. So we called on some friends from high school and that is what got the ball rolling, essentially. And I think that kind of sparked some uh, interesting aspects as well for that because um, when, while we were doing the show, it, Nicole being the dancer that she is, we, it was in the style of sort of a two week intensive except it was like a one week intensive yeah. where we all got together at the beginning of the week. We just worked for like a lot of hours and then we produced, we presented it that weekend. Um, it was really hot, really beautiful. It was like the, 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 the weather was hot at least. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, then we had, uh, we held like a, we had like a donation basket where people could donate if they wanted. It was free otherwise, but um, it was at my parents' house and on a lawn. So it was like, you know, we're not going to overcharge or anything, but it kind of, I think that was part of setting the seed for us wanting to be able to pay people in the future as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's the fact that. Or, no, go ahead. Oh, well, well, just like, um, yes, us, you know, the, the prospect of with the donations, we had acquired enough that we were able a very small amount, but we were able to pay people, which 
which for any artist, you know, any amount is is usually infinitely more than you get. Uh, so I think that kind of really sparked something for both of us and inspired us with now, how we are handling the company. As, as part of the public media discussion about mm -hmm. Between the Willows, they make reference to my friend Jay Schuster at Physicians Computer Company yep. may have offered some support to you. How, how did that happen? So um, for a long time, I've been involved with PCC, just in, 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 in the nature of like, they're incredibly generous to the greater Vermont theater community. Um, and 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 I I've I, uh, I've been very very lucky um, to have my friend Owen Levy uh, has worked at PCC for a, a great number of years. And if you're connected with PCC, then you I'm sure know Owen because Owen is just like the most like beautiful like soul person. Um, just does everything and loves everyone and does everything. It just an incredible human, but got me in and, and chatting um, with some of the folks up there. And uh, so, you know, as I was getting connected with uh, lots of different people in, in the community, um, I reached out and I, and, and we had built kind of a, a mutual foundation. Um, I don't know. Oh, uh, we, me and John, me and John had chatted a lot. Because I, uh, yes, sorry, brain re <laughs> renavigating. Uh, John was great in conversation, and I reached out to him when I, Nicole and I had finished writing the show, and um, I was like, "Hey, uh, I know you are super generous and super wonderful, and I want to let you know about this project that we're working on." Um, and we're really hoping to kind of get it off the ground. Um, and it would be great to have some of your support if you feel generous. Um, and if you feel like you're able to, it'd be great. And we were like, these are all the things we can do for you. Um, and John being the wonderful person that he is was like, here, I would more than happy to do it. Also, don't worry about the other stuff. Like we just want to support you. And um, that I, you know, that's, I, we could not have done it without John and PCC as a whole. I was going to say, in general, they have been incredibly supportive of the queer community. Exactly. It, some of the people who were it, who have been were involved in your production, who were interviewed, yes. talked about finally marginalized and underrepresented communities having their own voice and their own vehicle versus someone else writing about us and then asking us to portray it. What Was it your vision for Between the Willows that those of us who traditionally get overlooked will be the ones creating the vehicle and then we will be the ones performing it as well? Absolutely. That is really at the heart of kind of what we're doing here. Um, I mean, a lot of the, at least for the foreseeable future, a majority of the works that Nicole and I are going to be producing and staging are a original works. Um, so they are at least produced by queer artists. And um, B, uh, we, obviously anyone is welcome to participate in these productions. It's not, we're not trying to ostracize anyone um, of depending on sexuality or anything. It's just, we are, telling queer stories through a queer lens in a way that doesn't put them in, as this caricature of, of what they could be perceived to be. So, you know, you, you're not getting like the gay best friend who's just like all over the place and Beasts of Crete, which is our premiere production, <laughs> it is, <laughs> which is, is lovely by the way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in Beasts of Crete, um, there's a sapphic relationship that's queer just because it's queer. It's not queer mm -hmm. because of anything other than they just happen to love each other and fall in love. Um, it's a bit more complex than that, but, <laughs> it, you know, the, but it's just like that we can see love in a way that is authentic 
and present and is not meant for some weird like agenda point of view. It's just to tell queer love and to show queer joy and how it's affected um, by some of the standards and, and uh, outlines that are found in, in our society. That, that sounds good to me. And with our remaining time, yes. uh, Nicole, Nicole <laughs> I'm going to throw this to you, okay. please. What, what, what is the vision for Between the Willows going forward? What we might, what might we look forward to seeing being produced next, and how can I track what it is you're doing and when productions are happening? So, I am very excited about this upcoming season because it's going to be my turn this summer. The way we're kind of operating is last summer was Rise production, so this summer will be my production, and our summers are going to be our main production. Uh, we are hopefully, fingers crossed, going to get something for the winter or spring this year going as well. That's really like our big goal is to get two productions kind of off the ground, whether it's something smaller on a cabaret format that's a fundraiser or maybe a smaller, you know, casted play. We're hoping to get something. Um, but for the summer, I don't know how much I can reveal, but I can say that I'm planning a horror ballet, which I'm very excited about. Um, and it's based off of a grim fairy tale. I'm not going to say which one yet. That'll be announced around December. So watch for that. And I'm going to be using music from all queer artists, um, all queer composers who might not have gotten to have their short, their story shared before, because, you know, this happened, they wrote this music hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and we've never been able to say that this was a queer artist until now. Okay, so, but do you have a Facebook page or website? Oh, sorry, or yeah. How, how can I track you? I... We we have all of those. Um, okay. <laughs> but I feel like we primarily use our Instagram. That's kind of okay. our number one. What? <laughs> our number one spot that we're using. We're okay. also on TikTok and we do have a website. Yeah. Okay. So please give me those, those sites and we'll make sure they get displayed during this interview. And with that, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you for what you're trying to create here in Vermont. And Nicole, thank you for saying you want to come home. Yes. yes thank you so much for having us. It's been such, a, such a pleasure. Alrighty. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.